Hello, welcome to another episode of the 10 Minute Land Surveyor. I'm Dave Woolley. Today we're talking about a union apprenticeship program. I wanna talk about what the program is for those who maybe are unacquainted and talk about uh, some of the things that I think need to change in this program in order to be useful to the industry and useful to the members, uh, signatory members that is, and uh, sustainable in the long term. So when I'm talking about an apprenticeship program, uh, Local 12 Operating Engineers, Local 12 in Southern California, Local 3 in Northern California has an apprenticeship program. I'll go to their website and kind of walk you through what an apprentice actually is. Okay, you see on the screen here, semester one. And this semester one, as you can see, is uh, an introduction to land surveying. And you'll see the classes are an overview to land surveying, basic field operations, and these classes are, are very similar to Engineering 118 if you're in the community college system. And I, I, uh, I think this is a good introductory class. I've recently done an evaluation of the entire program and went through the homework and the assignments, so on and so forth. This is a good place to start. And when you start this, you're also uh, generally you are employed and you're working while you go to class. And the classes are pick a night, Tuesday night, and a handful of Saturdays through a semester. But see, they call it semester one, but let's be really clear, these are not semesters in the way that a college person would think of a semester. They're actually classes. They're one class. Uh, in, the, in a college, when you think of a semester, you think of uh, a minimum of 12 units, uh, up to 16, 18 units. But these are a single class. When they semester one, this is one class. And I'm gonna walk you through this program, then I'm gonna correlate it with, with, what they, with what they actually do there. So class two, survey procedures. And uh, when they say field notes and identification of monuments, this isn't with the understanding that a, a experienced survey would have. These are again, introductory classes. And so you spend a number of weeks in learning basic things. Uh, then you come into class two and you're expanding upon that. And then you're beginning to do uh, leveling methods. And when it says GPS systems, that's not setting up a GPS unit. That's certainly not post-processing or anything like that. It's all introductory work. Uh, plan reading and grade sheets. Now, one of the things that I really do like that I feel is a strength of the program is the plan reading. Uh, the plan reading classes are extensive. Uh, the solving of triangles is extensive. I don't know how practical that is today. I don't know that uh, we spend a lot of time solving triangles, but they do in the class. Uh, good knowledge, but I don't know what the applicability is at the level and depth uh, that they do it in the class, but we'll move on. Class three is measuring systems and this is, when this says bearings and angles and things like this, they're converting uh, bearings to azimuths, and this is where the trig comes in. Uh, semester three is, is really heavy in triangles. Uh, there's really not much in there about slope staking, electronic distance meters. Uh, th th these are mostly handouts that you would read. They're, they're very dated. It's one of the challenges of this program. Uh, locally, a lot of people refer to uh, Local 12 as that 70s show. And when you look at the program, a lot of the material in there is dated. I saw some uh, 1992 ALTA standards, some 1999 ALTA standards. But at an introductory level, I think it's acceptable. Um, class four, geometry, horizontal vertical curves, traverses. Uh, now they're really starting to get into this, but now you're, you're one class from graduation. Uh, if I were to write this program, I think some of these things in class four could move up to class three, <clears throat> so on and so forth. I think you could take the fifth class shown here, surveying projects, and I think you could uh, do go a little deeper dive. Now, when you see here U.S. public land system, property corners, subdivision surveys, these are real introductory. What they do is they give them copies of subdivision maps and they'll say, you know, what's the size of this lot? And uh, again, real, real basic information. ALTA surveys, they have some 1999 standards. I didn't see anything on the final test concerning ALTA standards. Uh, scope of the profession, again, this is mostly reading. 
So to give you a sense of where they finish up, I don't want to give away their test, but to give you a sense of where they finish up, I'm looking at their final exam here. And uh, anchor bolts must be located horizontally to the closest inch. True or false? Yeah, I go through and I, you know, that, that's, that's after the fifth class. Um, you're looking at a construction plan set uh, made by an architect, and so they say, at what column lines are billboard signs located? What is the width of the perimeter footing along 25 line? What is the depth of the perimeter footing along the 25 line? It's, it's rather construction intensive. Uh, what are the dimensions of the six inch slab at P4 level? And these, these, are the, these are the final exam questions. What is the existing ground elevation at the southwest tract corner? What is the curb flow line elevation at the center line driveway of lot four? To what elevation are sewer stakes graded? And then you develop a cut sheet. Uh, they, they give you some uh, plan and profiles and you develop a cut sheet. So after five classes, that's your final exam. That's what you're studying. And, and it, it's, it's very much anchored in construction and it's relatively uh, fundamental. I actually like the classes. I think that they could condense the material they have. They could certainly update it. And then what I'd like to see them do is take a little deeper dive. Uh, there, there isn't anything in there about doing adjustments, uh, Starnet, uh, TBC, anything like that, and, and you know that's a fundamental, basic thing that is required. So you go through your five classes and you accumulate about, uh, I believe, uh, 6,000 hours, which is three years, and then you graduate uh, after these five classes and 6,000 hours as a chainman. Now when you become a chainman, then you go to a quarter system as a party chief. Now these are all elective classes. Now, if you hire party chiefs uh, from the union, uh, they're certified, but there's a couple different ways that they do that. Ideally, you want them to have went through the certified party chief classes. You don't want them getting self-certified because they've done so many hours of something. Uh, that's basically worthless. Uh, to give you a sense what the certification process is, is they keep track of some hours, the employer signs off on them. The certifications are like, GPS is a certification. I think there's a heavy construction. I think there's a topo. All, all said and done, there's five or six certifications, but they don't in involve this coursework. So when you ask for a certified party chief, talking to you, Caltrans, who puts a licensed party chief on the same bar on a contract as a certified party chief, let's talk about what, what you're getting. So what you have here, laptop surveying, aerial photogrammetry, and they, they talk about TBC, uh, some various things. Now, if this was something that they did, of course, it would be a great benefit. But I think that you'll find that there's very few real certified party chiefs that actually went through the classes in party chief school. But I think there would be a marked difference between a certified party chief that went through the school and a chainman. So you would say, well, why wouldn't what, why wouldn't they be motivated to go to party chief school? Well, let me show you why they don't go to party chief school. I'm going to bring up the wages here. Okay, so if you take five classes and it says zero to 4,000 hours, I thought it was 6,000, but if you take your five classes and you work 4,000 hours, you're making $48.68 an hour. Now, if you take the uh, semesters and you go through the certified party chief school and pass, you make $52 an hour. So for a buck 50, a buck 40, what happens is, is you take all these classes to pick up a buck 40 and a whole lot more responsibility. It's not worth it. This is one of the problems with the apprenticeship program, as I see it is, is there's no separation between a chief and a, uh, a chainman. I wouldn't become a chief and take all those classes. I believe it's, they call it nine quarters. So, you know, 36 weeks of classes to pick up a buck 50. I don't think the chiefs are overpaid. I think the chainmen are overpaid. And when you look at how it is, 4,000 hours is two years. It, it, again, there's a 6,000 hour to get out of the apprenticeship program. So in three years, uh, you're making 
48 bucks an hour and you have basically five fundamental classes. Well, you go to the extra work, you put in the extra hours for a buck 50, <clears throat> program doesn't work and it doesn't work for that reason. Now keep in mind that most of these folks don't have LSITs. Uh, apparently they're too busy to pick up a six hour exam and pass it. And that, that's, that's, a, that's a shame, that's unfortunate. Okay, let's take a little bit deeper dive on this chainman. So as a chainman, you start out uh, $20.45 an hour, which is a good starting wage. Uh, I believe minimum wage now is $15 an hour. So you're 25% you're over minimum wage when you get into the apprenticeship program. And that's zero to 500 hours. And you'll see the, what they have up there. It's very, very basic. It's the first 500 hours, you average 173 hours. It's about three months in. And you're in the apprenticeship program at this point. Okay, when you get to a thousand hours, which is six months of work, uh, you, you don't have much more uh, skills than when you have three months. You can see what they have here, field staking procedures. But now you jump up to 2385 an hour at a thousand hours. When you cross over to Apprentice C, now you're $27 an hour. You really don't know a whole lot about anything yet because when you think about where the apprenticeship program is and each one of those classes are about let's just say 20-25 weeks so the, they're over the course of a year you have six months to get through the first class it syncs with about your apprentice C and uh, when you go to look at those they're not teaching you uh, use of RTK and GPS and certainly not use of scanners if you l line this up with the actual classrooms. Uh, you, you go through apprentice D two to three thousand hours so now you're a year to a year and a half in that means you're halfway through the classroom work. You keep rolling through apprentice E 4,000 hours, two years, 5,000 hours, two and a half years. Apprentice F is just about the time you're going to graduate uh, from the apprenticeship program if they don't have any breaks in there. And then you have G, uh, you're really in sync. You're, you're, at, you're at two and a half years to three years. You finish up the apprenticeship program right here and you're making $38 an hour and then as soon as you hit your 6,000 hours, now you're up to $48, uh, $48 an hour. Here's one of the weaknesses to the program and why I think that they're, they're, they're either overpaid or the chiefs are underpaid, whichever you choose, is you take your salary at $20 an hour, we'll say $20.45 here, three years later, you have 6,000 hours and you're at two and a half times your salary in three years. Well, frankly, uh, that, that model, I think it's the chainmen are overpaid. That doesn't make sense that you would do two and a half after taking five fundamental classes to become a chainman. Well, okay, let's just say the market bears this and let's just say that this, these folks are, are paid for these hours because they, they earn it. Well, the backside of this is, is you pay about $26 an hour for every hour they work in fringe benefit. And so, when you see $46 an hour, that's really closer to $80 an hour that you're paying $75, $80 an hour for somebody that has taken five classes over the course of three years. And they tend to be one dimensional when they get through this because they're still green. But then the challenge is, is if you want this person to become on a professional tract and you get somebody who's, who's uh, ambitious and smart and you want to help them out, well, you can't bring them in with three years experience costing the company about $80 an hour and try to teach them how to use Excel or try to teach them how to use Starnet. And so what happens is, is you end up with surveyors that really have a narrow skill set, field surveyors, and that's all they are is field surveyors, meaning they can't be any more uh, because it costs too much money. You're not going to bring somebody in at 80 bucks an hour and try to teach them Starnet. And that's just the way it is, or how to process and register scans, or how to process anything for that matter. So then what happens is, is as the technology progresses and their skill set doesn't progress with it, meaning they're not cross-trained, uh, they get a new data collector and, and 
that's kind of the end of it. Or they get a new instrument every three or four years, and that's kind of the end of it, the technology. And that's to their own detriment. So what I would propose, and I don't know about the, uh, the ability or the willingness to do this, is when you have 6,000 hours and you're in this apprenticeship, B, C, D, when, especially when they're down here in the A, B, C range, uh, they, need, they need to have 1,000 hours, 1,500 hours, 2,000 hours in, in the office. They need to be able to draw up some corner records. They need to understand some AutoCAD. They need this program to have some modern skills. We can't be looking at uh, we, we, we can't be looking at track maps that are 20 years old and trying to determine what the grade is at the southwest corner because we all know machine control has done away with grading. We can't be teaching uh, things that are, are fundamentally no longer uh, what we do in land surveying. There's a good, good basis to understand triangles, but there's certainly no reason to understand a, a semester of triangles. Uh, it, they're good to understand how coordinates work, uh, X, Y, but you, you don't want to spend a lot of time calculating those by latitude and departures anymore. And that's where this program needs to be updated. It needs to be made current. And these folks need to learn skills that are in today's job force. And I'm talking about the young folks that are coming into the apprenticeship program. They need to have value in the office because what happens is if I have an apprentice A, B, C, D, or G, and they understand AutoCAD and they can, they can draw something, or they understand uh, registering scans, or they understand uh, modeling uh, BIM information, well, It'll never be worth it to have a $26 fringe, but at least if the work needs to be done and I have somebody that can do it, that there's a lot more value to, to the profession and certainly to, to the individual, and I would think also to the union. Now, the downside is, is you're paying folks too much money on the fringe side for, for basically benefits that could be provided for a, a third of that. They have a pension that's, that's headed right into the side of a mountain. That ends up being liability to the employers. And I'm gonna, as I mentioned before, I'm gonna go into the pension liability. But these poor folks, you know, in, in 2007, they were getting $58 a credit. And here we are, inflation going through the roof. This isn't the best deal. And, and the employers can't walk away from it because they have all this unfunded pension liability, really probably due to mismanagement because uh, you know the stock market's at 36,000 today. I'm looking at other pensions, pipe fitters, and they're 105% funded. Um, looking at uh, laborers and some of these people, they're funded. And operating engineers is dragging the bottom. And, and it's a damn shame when you have somebody that put 30 years in and they're barely getting by, haven't had a raise in almost 14 years, and I don't think they're getting one anytime soon. And we see the inflation coming up. It's a shame. And those employers contributed to this uh, pension fund. The employees believed in it, and now they're all screwed. So what I'd like to see done is modernize this apprenticeship program, bring it up to date, cross it over into the field in the office before they're making too much money. And one of the things is, is when the employees are making more money than is sustainable in the market, then what happens is, is people use them less. And technology becomes a viable alternative to labor. So that's, that's what I see happening. And that's where I think we can do better. In closing, what we need to do is we need to update this apprenticeship program, make it modern. We need people that can do the field work, bring it in and process it in the office. I want people that can do the scanning, bring it in, register it, and if I ask, model it. That's what needs to happen. I need them to post-process GPS, come up with solutions. I, I really don't see a capacity of uh, wood in the ground is, is a viable solution. Now it's too late for the generation that's my age. They're, they're stuck eating cat food. But I think I'd like to see this program expand and become something of value to the next generation. It's time to put away our clown shoes, pack away our mini bikes, and update this apprenticeship program. Thank you and have a nice day.